This is fourth lecture for GI physiology. Macronutrients, including carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, cannot be absorbed in their natural forms through the gastrointestinal tract until they are digested into small enough compounds. Nutrients released from the food must be adequately absorbed to meet the body's needs. Today, we will cover four topics. First, we will look at digestion. There are two major types of digestion. One is luminal digestion, and the other one is membrane digestion. Luminal digestion occurs in the lumen of gastrointestinal tract. Membrane digestion is catalyzed by enzymes on brush border of enterocytes. Here are the digestive enzymes. Among them, enzymes that digest lipids are shaded in green. Enzymes that digest proteins are shaded in orange. Here we will first look at digestion of carbohydrates. This picture shows 20 to 40 percent of starch is broken down to maltose and small polymers by salivary alpha amylase, and the rest is digested by pancreatic amylase. Maltose, lactose, and sucrose are digested by maltase, lactase, and sucralase, respectively. They are the enzymes on the membranes of enterocytes. The final products of carbohydrate digestion are monosaccharides, mostly glucose. Digestion of proteins takes place in three locations. First, in the lumen. It is catalyzed by pepsin in the stomach, enterokinase, and exopeptidases in the small intestine. Second, in the brush border, it is catalyzed by oligopeptidases and dipeptidases. Finally, in the cytoplasm of mucosal cells, it is catalyzed by dipeptidases. As we know from previous lecture, enterokinase activates trypsinogen. Then trypsin activates other proenzymes. Finally, proteolytic enzymes digest themselves at the end of digestive process. The major dietary lipid is triglyceride. It is broken down to two monoglycerides and fatty acids by pancreatic lipase. Within enterocytes, fatty acids and two monoglycerides are converted back to triglyceride. This process occurs in three steps. First step is emulsification, in which large aggregates of dietary triglycerides are broken down into small particles. Second, pancreatic lipase cleaves triglyceride into two monoglyceride and fatty acids. Both can diffuse into enterocytes. Third, within enterocytes, two monoglyceride and fatty acids are converted back to triglyceride. As we know from biochemistry, emulsification requires bio salts and phosphatidylcholine. Digestion of lipids is catalyzed by three enzymes. Pancreatic lipase cleaves triglycerides. Cholesterol esterase cleaves cholesterol esters. Phospholipases cleave 
phospholipids. Now, let's move to part two. We will look at general principles of gastrointestinal absorption. Different nutrients and chemicals are absorbed in different sites. For example, stomach absorbs ethanol and aspirin. Duodenum and jejunum absorb macronutrients, vitamins, water, and electrolytes. The ileum absorbs bile salts and vitamin B12. This has a major clinical significance. Colon absorbs water and electrolytes. Rectum absorbs sterol and aspirin. A nutrient must cross eight barriers before it arrives in the blood or limb. Here are eight barriers from unstirred water layer to the wall of capillary or lymph vessel. In the small intestine, there are a large number of folds, which are called folds of cookery. These folds increase surface area of the absorptive mucosa threefold. Presence of villi increase internal surface area another tenfold. This is a villus, and this is a vascular system that is used to absorb fluid and nutrients into the portal blood. Central lactea is used to absorb fats into the lymph. This picture shows a single epithelial cell on a villus. On the surface of the cell, there are as many as thousand projections, which are called microvilli. These microvilli form a brushed border. Microvilli increase the internal surface area another 20-fold. Angelocytes turn over every five days. Angelocytes are shred into lumen to become part of digester, to be digested and absorbed. Four mechanisms are important in transport of nutrients across intestinal cell membrane. First one is active transport. Primary active transport requires ATP. Secondary active transport requires sodium gradient. Second is passive diffusion. Third is facilitated diffusion that use transporters. Fourth is endocytosis. Single most important process in small intestine to make absorption of nutrients possible is establishment of electrochemical gradient of sodium across apical membrane. Every day, around 9 liter of fluid enter the GI tract. Among them, 2 liter from the food. The other is from gastrointestinal secretions. Most of the fluid is absorbed, especially small intestine, absorbs around 7.5 liter. The colon absorbs 1.4 liter, with only 100 to 200 milliliter excreted. Now, let's move to part three. We will look at absorption in the small intestine. In the small intestine, water is absorbed by osmosis. It begins with sodium absorption, which creates an active electrical gradient. The electrical gradient drives chloride uptake. Water then follows sodium and chloride by osmotic forces. Essentially, all the carbohydrates in the food 
are absorbed in the form of monosaccharides. Virtually all the monosaccharides are absorbed by an active transport process carried out by SGLT1. It stands for sodium glucose linked transporter 1. It is a co transporter. It transports glucose and galactose along with sodium. Energy comes from sodium gradient established by sodium potassium ATPase. A small amount of monosaccharides are absorbed through facilitated diffusion. Specifically, GLUT2 absorbs all three, but preferably galactose and fructose. GLUT5 transports mainly fructose. Most proteins after digestion are absorbed in the form of dipeptide, tripeptide, and amino acids. Dipeptide and tripeptides are absorbed through proton-dependent co-transporters. Amino acids are absorbed by sodium-dependent co-transporters. Small peptides are absorbed faster than amino acids. This information is summarized in this slide. Main digestive end products of lipids are two monoglyceride and three fatty acids. Together with bile salts, they form micelles. Micelles approach the microvilli of the intestinal brush border. Two monoglyceride and three fatty acids diffuse out of micelles and enter the interior of epithelial cell. My cell returned to absorb new 2 monoglyceride and free fatty acids. They perform a fairy function. After entering the cells, 2 monoglyceride and free fatty acids are taken up by the smooth ER, where they are resynthesized into new triglyceride and packaged into chiromicron. Chiromicrons are released into the lymph vessels. This information is summarized in this slide. Here is clinical correlation. Mild absorption is defined clinically in terms of fat mild absorption because fat can be measured easily. Mild absorption can be caused by either motility disorders. That's the chyme moves through the GI tract too rapidly or digestion disorders. Mild absorption can also be caused by absorption disorders. Here, SPLU is a condition with reduced absorption even when food is well digested. It comes in two forms. One is tropical SPLU. The other one is non-tropical. Tropical SPLU is caused by bacterial infection. Non-tropical SPLU is caused by allergy to gluten or other foods. It results in damage of microvilli and sometimes villi by cell-mediated immune response. Here, we will look at salt absorption in the small intestine. Salt is absorbed across apical cell membrane by four mechanisms. First, by diffusion through sodium channel. Second, by co-transport with amino acid or glucose. Third, by co-transport with chloride. Fourth, 
by coal transport with proton. Most of chloride is transported across the epithelium by following the electrochemical gradient of sodium ion. This information is summarized in this slide. Please note that large quantity of bicarbonates are absorbed in duodenum and jejunum. Every day diet provides about 5 to 8 grams of sodium chloride per day. Small intestine secretes 20 to 30 grams per day. But the intestine absorbs 25 to 35 grams of sodium chloride per day, with only a small amount excreted. Decreased absorption of sodium can lead to rapid sodium depletion and death. Finally, we will look at absorption in the large intestine. About 1500 milliliters of chyme arrive in the large intestine each day. Most of water and electrolytes in the chyme are absorbed in the colon, with less than 100 milliliters of fluid to be excreted. Similar to small intestine, large intestine has a high capacity for active absorption of sodium, along with chloride. Maximum absorption capacity of the large intestine is about 5 to 8 liters of fluid and electrolytes. When the total quantity entering the large intestine through the ileum cecal valve or by way of large intestinal secretion exceeds the capacity, it leads to diarrhea as seen in cholera. Cholera toxin causes crypts in the terminal ileum and large intestine to secrete 10 liters or more fluid, leading to diarrhea. As we know from previous lecture, large quantity of water is secreted into lumen of small and large intestines during normal digestive in absorptive processes. This can be driven by increased osmotic pressure in the lumen due to presence of food, or crypt cells actively secrete electrolytes leading to water secretion. We will focus on crypt cells. As we have seen from previous lecture, enterocytes within Crypts of Lipacum actively secrete chloride through CFTR. When chloride exits cells, sodium and water follow. This picture shows CFTR is open when phosphorylated by protein kinase A. Here is integration with microbiology in biochemistry. Cholera toxin produced by bacterium Vibrio cholerae inactivates GTPase activity of the G protein and keeps GFS in a GTP bound state. As we know, GFS is active when bound with GTP. As a result, cholera toxin leads to an increase in cyclic AMP level. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylates CFTR and opens the channel. The consequence is watery diarrhea. If untreated, 50% of patients will die. For treatment, oral rehydration solutions that contain glucose and electrolytes should be administered immediately.